We began our study of consumer choice by stating that economists assume that consumers choose to consume the combination of goods that they consider to be the best out of the ones that they can afford. In the previous chapter, we examined how to characterize the combinations of goods that consumers can afford using the concepts of the budget line and the budget set. In this chapter, we will build a model of consumer preferences, which allows us to determine which combination of goods a consumer likes the best. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to do the following things. First, you should explain what it means for preferences to be monotonic, what it means for preferences to be convex, and you should be able to explain the difference between cardinal and ordinal utility. Next, you should be able to use indifference curves to illustrate a given set of consumer preferences. And you should be able to calculate a consumer's marginal rate of substitution using an indifference curve. Finally, you should be able to explain what a consumer's marginal rate of substitution means in layperson's terms. Before we begin our study of preferences, we are going to introduce a few basic mathematical concepts from set theory. If these concepts are completely new to you, don't worry. They're relatively simple. Let's start by defining a set. A set is simply a set of things, whether they be quantities, prices, numbers, objects, or people, that share some common trait. For example, one set of cadets at the academy would be the set of all cadets for whom one or both parents also went to the academy. For each cadet, we could determine whether or not they were in this set. You have already studied one set in this course, the budget set. The budget set is the set of all combinations of quantities of goods one and two that the consumer can afford. Formally, we could say that the budget set is the set of all x1 and x2 such that p1 times x1 plus p2 times x2 is less than or equal to the consumer's income, m. If the combination of x1 and x2 makes the equation on the right-hand side of the colon true, then that combination of x1 and x2 is affordable and hence it's in the budget set. Now that we have established what a set is, we can define what a convex set is. A set is convex if for any two points in the set, the weighted average of the two points is also in the set. If you find this definition to be as clear as mud, don't worry, we are going to break it down. First, you may be wondering what a weighted average is. Certainly you know that to find the average of two numbers, you simply add them together and divide by two. The simple average is a special case of a weighted average in which x1 and x2 receive equal weight. To see this, you can rewrite the equation for the average as 1 half times x1 plus 1 half times x2. The numbers that x1 and x2 are multiplied by are called the weights, which in this case are the same and equal to 1 half. More generally, a weighted average is any sum of this type in which the coefficients of x1 and x2 add up to 1. So for example, other weighted averages would be 1 third x1 plus 2 thirds x2, 1 fourth x1 plus 3 fourths x2, 1 fifth x1 plus 4 fifths x2, and so on. You can think about convex sets mathematically, but you can also think about them graphically. Let's think about our example of the budget set from the previous chapter. To determine if the set is convex, first pick any two points in the set. Note that the set includes the blue line and both axes, so you can pick any point in the shaded green triangle or on the blue or black lines. Let's pick two representative points. The weighted averages of these two combinations of goods 1 and 2 will be on a line that connects these two points. In order for the set to be convex, the entire line connecting the two points must be in the budget set, and this must be true for every possible pair of points in the set. Hopefully, if you play around with choosing different pairs of points in the budget set and drawing a line between them, you will see that for any pair that you pick, the line between them is always in the budget set, and thus the budget set is a convex set. 
Let's consider now the case of a non-convex set. The budget line pictured here has a bend in it. You should think about what kind of market situation could generate a budget line with a bend in it. Note that the bend in the line indicates that for quantities that exceed x1 star, the budget line is flatter. Since the slope of the budget line is negative p1 over p2, this means that on the lower half of the line, either the price of good 1 is less than for the top segment, the price of good 2 is greater than for the top segment, or some combination of these two things. One possible scenario is a volume discount in which the consumer receives a lower price per unit if she buys more than x1 star units of good 1. The budget set is still all combinations of x1 and x2 on or inside the budget line, but this set is not a convex set. To see why, let's pick two points on the edge of the set. The weighted average of these two points is still a line connecting them. However, as you can see, except for the endpoints, this line is not in the budget set. Therefore, this set is not a convex set. Keep these examples in mind as we build our model of consumer preferences. The notion of a convex set turns out to be very useful in characterizing certain types of consumer preferences. In describing consumer preferences, economists use the idea of a consumption bundle. A bundle is simply a combination of goods that a consumer could potentially choose. As an example, consider these three bundles, which represent different combinations of leave, extra credit, and cash that you could potentially choose. Which one would you choose? Why? Did you have difficulty choosing your favorite? Do you feel that you might be equally happy with two of the three bundles, or perhaps with all three? When economists model consumer preferences, we are simply modeling how consumers make trade-offs like the ones that are present in the choice among these bundles. Keep this example in mind as we start to think about how to build a useful model of consumer preferences. The first thing economists assume about consumer preferences is that consumers are able to make a choice. Formally, this means that economists assume that preferences are complete. For any pair of bundles, the consumer is able to tell us either x is better than y, y is better than x, or x and y are equally good. If for some pair of bundles x and y, the consumer cannot decide one of these three things, then her preferences are not complete. Let's consider a couple of examples with the bundles above. Cadet Genius likes to get good grades, so he always prefers bundles that have more extra credit points to bundles that have less. If two bundles have the same amount of extra credit points, he considers them to be equally good. Cadet Genius will always be able to decide that one bundle is better than another, or that he likes two bundles equally well, so his preferences are complete. A second cadet, Cadet Play, likes leave and cash. Thus, he always prefers bundles with more leave and more cash to bundles that have less leave and less cash. If two bundles have the same amount of leave and cash, Cadet Play considers them to be equally good. Note that cadet play's preferences result in some unresolvable conflicts. For example, bundle A is better than bundle B in terms of leave, but bundle B is better than bundle A in terms of cash. Thus, cadet play is not going to be able to give us a definitive answer about which of these two bundles is better, and thus his preferences are not complete. Assuming that a consumer's preferences are complete, she should be able to tell us which bundle is better or that she is indifferent between the two bundles. If bundle A is strictly better than bundle B, then we write A is strictly preferred to B. The strictly preferred symbol indicates strict preference. It looks like the greater than sign, except it has curved sides. If the consumer is indifferent between bundles A and B, then we write A is indifferent to B, where the indifference sign looks like a squiggle. If bundle A is ad, as good as or better than bundle B, we write A is weakly preferred to B. This notation indicates weak preference, which means that bundle A is preferred or indifferent 
to bundle B. The symbol for weak preference is similar to the greater than or equal sign, except that it is curved. Economists make two more assumptions about preferences. First, we assume that every bundle is at least as good as itself. Hopefully, you will find this assumption about preferences to be non-controversial. When preferences satisfy this assumption, we say that they are reflexive. The second assumption is about consistency in choices. If consumers prefer bundle A to bundle B and bundle B to bundle C, then it must be the case that the consumer prefers bundle A to bundle C. We call this property of preferences transitivity. Note that you may not think that this assumption is all that unreasonable, but it is not uncommon to find violations of transitivity in data about actual consumer choices. Now that we have established some basic conditions for consumer preferences, we can develop a graphical model to represent different types of preferences. These models are called indifference curves. An indifference curve simply represents a set of consumption bundles between which the consumer is indifferent. The set of all consumption bundles that are as good as or better than the bundles on the indifference curve is called the weakly preferred set. For goods that are good, these bundles will be on to the northeast of the indifference curve. Using the definition provided earlier, ask yourself whether this set is a convex set. Let's now think about a few of the different types of preferences we can represent with different types of indifference curves. When you start out drawing indifference curves, start by plotting a single point. Then ask yourself, what other points will the consumer like the same as this point? Once you do that, you will have the consumer's indifference curve. Let's start with a simple example. Consider two goods, coffee and tea. Suppose that you view these two goods to be substitutes. However, you require two cups of tea to replace each cup of coffee since tea has a lower caffeine content than coffee. To draw this indifference curve, let's start with one possible consumption bundle, which would be one cup of coffee and no cups of tea. What is another bundle that you like as well as one cup, cup of coffee? One obvious bundle is two cups of tea and no cups of coffee. Since you like these two bundles equally well, we know that these two points are on the same indifference curve. A third bundle that would also be on the curve is one cup of tea and one half cup of coffee. Thus, we can see that for goods that are perfect substitutes, the indifference curve will be a straight line. The slope of the curve tells you the rate at which you're willing to substitute one good for another. In this case, for each unit of coffee you give up, you require twice as much tea to remain as well off as before, so the slope of the indifference curve is one half. Another interesting case is the case of perfect complements. Complements are goods that you typically consume together, like hot dogs and buns. For example, I always like to eat one hot dog with one bun. So that combination represents a point on my indifference curve. To figure out where the other points are, start by moving to the right from the red X. If I have one hot dog, but two buns, three buns, or four buns, I am no better off. So I am indifferent between these points and one hot dog and one bun. Note that this statement assumes that I can throw away extra buns for free. Similarly, if I start at the red X and move up so that I still have one bun, but two, three, or four hot dogs, I am no better off, so I am indifferent between all of these combinations and the combination of one hot dog and one bun. Thus, for goods that are perfect complements, the indifference curves will always be L-shaped. The corner of the L shows the consumer's ideal consumption proportion for the two goods. We will consider two more special kinds of indifference curves. The first are goods that you like less of, which we could also call bads. For me, a bad is lima beans. The fewer lima beans I have to eat, the better. Conversely, I love chocolate. To think about what my indifference curves for these two goods might look like, let's start with a point on the horizontal axis, where I have a positive amount of lima beans and no chocolate. Obviously, I don't like this point very much. 
Let's think about my preferences for points near this point. If I move to the left so that I have the same amount of chocolate but fewer lima beans, I like that point better, so it would not be on the same indifference curve as the first point. If I move straight up so that I have the same amount of lima beans but more chocolate, that point is also better, so that must not be on the same indifference curve as the first point either. Finally, if I move to the right so that I have the same amount of chocolate but more lima beans, this point is worse than the starting point. Thus, this point is not on the same indifference curve as the first point either. To summarize, points to the left of the starting point are better, points above the starting point are better, and points to the right of the starting point are worse. Therefore, the points that are indifferent to the starting point must be somewhere between the points that are better and the points that are worse. These bundles would have more lima beans than the starting point, but also more chocolate to compensate me for the extra lima beans that I have to eat. One possibility is a line like this one. The slope of this line would tell you how much chocolate I require to eat an additional lima bean. Note that this is one possible shape of an indifference curve when the consumer likes one good and dislikes the other. Another possibility would be a curve as opposed to a straight line. Note that in this graph, the better bundles are to the northwest of the indifference curve. Think about what the indifference curves would look like if you were graphing two bads rather than just one. If instead of hating lima beans, I didn't care about them one way or the other, my indifference curves would look like this. Note that because all I care about is the amount of chocolate I consume, I am indifferent between a given amount of chocolate and either no lima beans or a lot of lima beans. In the case of this graph, the better bundles are to the north. If you reverse the axes, you will get the graph of indifference curves for one good that is good and one good that is neutral that is in your textbook. If you have two bads, is there a better bundle than zero, zero? Hopefully your answer to that question is no. Although this case probably exists for some consumers and some goods, for most of our models we are going to assume this case away by assuming four things. First, we're going to assume that goods are good. Second, because goods are good, we are going to assume that consumers prefer to have more of a good to less of it. The fancy phrase to describe this assumption is that we assume that consumers have monotonic preferences. Third, there is no maximum amount of good that a consumer wants to consume. There is always a bundle out there with a little bit more that she likes better. We call this property of preferences local non-satiation. Finally, we assume that consumers prefer averages to extremes. That is, rather than a consumer bundle that has a lot of one good and a little bit of another, the consumer prefers to consume bundles that have average amounts of both goods. This assumption means that consumers have convex preferences. Graphically, the assumption of convex preferences means that the set of all points that are as good or better than the points on the indifference curve, which we call the weakly preferred set, is a convex set. Let's review what we've assumed about preferences. First, we've assumed that preferences are complete which means that a consumer is able to come to a decision about how she likes or doesn't like any pair of bundles. Second, we assume that preferences are reflexive, which means that each bundle is at least as good as itself. Third, we assume that preferences are transitive, which avoids circularity in consumer choices. Fourth, we assume that goods are good, and because they are good, a little more is always better, and there is no best point. Finally, we have assumed that preferences are convex, which means that averages are preferred to extremes. Most important about what we have assumed in building our model of preferences is what we have not assumed. For one, we have not assumed anything about the strength of consumer preferences. Thus, we do not assume that a consumer can tell us how much better she likes one bundle over another. As a result, statements like bundle A is twice as good as bundle B are completely meaningless in this model. 
This last point cannot be emphasized enough. In economics, we do not assume anything about the magnitude of a consumer's preferences. We call models that have something to say about the magnitude of consumer's preferences models of cardinal preferences. All we assume is that given two bundles, a consumer can rank order them or tell us that she is indifferent between them. These preference models are called ordinal preference models. All of the models of consumer choice that we do in economics, including deriving demand curves, estimating a consumer's willingness to pay for a product, and cost-benefit analysis, only require the assumption of ordinal preferences. The slope of an indifference curve tells us useful information about a consumer's preferences. The slope of an indifference curve is called the marginal rate of substitution, or MRS. This slope tells us how many units of good two the consumer is willing to give up to get an additional unit of good one and remain as well off as before the trade. Note that on a stereotypical indifference curve, such as the one pictured here, when the consumer has a lot of good two and not very much of good one, she is willing to give up a lot of good two to get one more unit of good one. However, when the consumer has a lot of good one, she is willing to give up less good two to get an additional unit of good one. Thus, the marginal rate of substitution diminishes as you move down the indifference curve. Diminishing marginal rate of substitution is one example of the principle of diminishing returns that you learned about in your introductory economics course. When goods are perfect substitutes, the marginal rate of substitution is constant. Note that because we are talking about goods, the MRS is always negative. To remain indifferent, the consumer has to give up some of one good and get more of the other good. If goods are perfect complements, then along the horizontal leg of the indifference curve, the MRS is zero. The consumer will not give up any of good two to get more of good one because she already has too much of good one. Along the vertical leg, the MRS is infinite. Along this leg, the consumer has too much good two, so she's willing to give up a whole bunch of it to get one more unit of good one. At the corner, the consumer does not have an MRS. She is at her ideal consumption ratio and so is unwilling to change. This concludes this chapter on preferences. In class, be prepared to explain and apply the concepts that you learned about in this presentation.